Committee on Government Operations to Order. My name is Julie Green and I'm the MLA for Yellowknife Centre and the Deputy Chair of this committee. I'll now ask the members to introduce themselves and I'll start on my right. Thank you. My name is Caitlin Cleveland, MLA Cam Lake. My name is Frida Martzellos, MLA for Tabatcha. Lisa Semler, MLA for Anubis Twin Lakes. Rylan Johnson, MLA Yellowknife North. Thank you, members, and we also have with us uh, our committee clerk, uh, Mr. Glenn Rutland, and uh, <coughs> Ms. April Taylor, who is our committee advisor. Today's meeting is being live streamed on the Assembly's social media channels. To respect physical distancing requirements, non-committee members and the Information and Privacy Commissioner are attending by video conference. Our first order of business is to open our meeting with a prayer, and I will ask Emily Frieda Marcellos to offer that prayer, and she would prefer that we remain seated. Thank you. Dear Lord, what is the world coming to? Every time I read the newspaper, every time we turn on the radio or television, there are reports that stir up insecurities in us about the future. What is going to happen with the economy? the society, our government, the earth itself. What will our lives look like in 10 years? What will the next generation be facing? How are our grandchildren going to fare in this world? It feels as though everything is falling apart. But we know the future is in your hands, Lord. So help us be faithful to what you have for us to do today and to let you take care of what lies ahead. Remind us that you have a plan and that we trust in you. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, uh, MLA Marcellos. Our next item is the review and the adoption of the agenda. Mr. Clerk, will you walk us through that, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, so we have one matter on, on the agenda that is a public matter, which is the review of the 2018-2019 report of the Information and Privacy Commissioner. You do have uh, Ms. Keeney Benz, the uh, uh, Madam Commissioner, uh, present for that. Uh, time permitting, uh, committee uh, will move in camera just to discuss uh, upcoming reports. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rutland. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda, members? Uh, hearing no changes, can I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, MLA Cleveland has moved adoption of the agenda. The motion is in order. All of those in favor? Thank you, the motion is carried. Having reviewed and adopted the agenda, are there any declarations of conflict of interest? Seeing none, we will now move on to our first public matter. And I'd like to say good morning to Ms. Elaine Keenan-Banks, our Information and Privacy Commissioner. Before you begin your opening remarks. I would just like to discuss how the meeting will proceed. All comments and questions and remarks will need to be directed to me as the chair. Both the members and witnesses will need to wait to be recognized by me before speaking. <coughs> this is a, pro a process that's required to allow the committee clerk to turn off and on people's microphones. So with that, uh, Madam Commissioner, the floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm having a little bit of problems hearing, so I may have to uh, ask for repeats, but um, other than that looks good here. Uh, good morning. Um, we are today living in interesting times, and while I would rather be presenting this in person, I do appreciate being given the opportunity to meet with you virtually, uh, to share with you some of the highlights of my 2018-2019 annual report. <clears throat> As you know, my role is to provide independent oversight with respect to issues around access to public records, as well as with respect to how the Government of Northwest Territories and its agencies collect, use, and disclose personal information under the Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act. That act came into effect on December 31st, 1996. In October 2015, with the coming into force of the Health Information Act, my office was given the additional mandate of independent oversight uh, of access to information and protection of privacy in the health sector, 
which includes both governmental and non-governmental health organizations. Perhaps the highlight of the year in 2018-2019 for my office came in June of last year when Bill, Bill 29, an act to amend the Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act received royal assent. This bill represents the first major amendment to the legislation in more than 20 years. The changes that will result from this bill are numerous, exciting and progressive. Some of the highlights include making the Northwest Territories the sixth jurisdiction in Canada, including the Federal Access to Information, Commission, uh, Access to Information Commissioner who was given order powers about this time last year um, to give uh, the Information and Privacy Commissioner order making power. It also lays the ground the groundwork for including municipalities under the legislation, something that I have been advocating since my very first annual report in 1997-1998. It also makes several procedural changes intended to streamline the access to information process. On the privacy side, the bill provides for mandatory breach notifications to affected individuals and to the, inform and to the Information and Privacy Commissioner and establishes the requirement for the preparation of privacy impact assessments, something already being done on an, odd, an, on an ad hoc basis, but uh, which are not mandated. These amendments reflect the monumental change in the way the world does business and the ever increasing importance of data as a valuable commodity. To give some perspective, the world's first website did not go live until 1990. And in 1993, there are only 130 websites. Can you imagine? Yahoo was not created until 1994, which by the way, was the same year the first massive commercial spam email message was sent. In 1995, only 3% of online users had ever signed on to the World Wide Web and only 65% of online users reported having sent or received an email at least once a week. My, how things have changed. Mm -hmm. Google wasn't founded until 1998 and Facebook wasn't created until 2004. Compare this to today, virtually all business involves some kind of computing requirement from beekeeping to healthcare and the amount of information collected, used, manipulated, and exchanged every day is unfathomable. Kids graduating from high school today have never known a time without computers and smartphones. While this explosion of technology allows us to do things we could only have dreamed of 25 years ago, it also brings new responsibilities and new, new challenges. As Nunavut unfortunately learned in November of last year, ransomware and other malicious apps can shut down an entire government. The passing of Bill 29 was therefore one of the highlights for the year. <clears throat> unfortunately, as of today, almost a year later, it still does not have a coming into force date. And this is disappointing and disheartening particularly as there is no indication of an anticipated date for this. It is also disappointing that I am noticing significantly increased lack of capacity within public bodies to address access and privacy issues. The timeframes for responding to ATIP requests are not being met and submissions to my office are significantly lacking in detail. Exceptions to disclosure are not well applied. I'm seeing huge delays and a failure to respond to correspondence from my office almost across the board. I understand that it is difficult to hire ATIP personnel with appropriate training and to keep those employees in those positions. One major department uh, went through three ATIP coordinators in the space of about eight months and none of them were properly trained to do the work. I believe this is decreased this I believe that this decrease in capacity to deal with access and privacy issues 
is partially because expertise in the area of access and privacy is not highly valued in the job evaluation process, and the pay levels necessary to attract a high level of expertise is not, therefore, being met. Whatever the reason, public bodies are going to have to step up in a big way once Bill 29 comes into effect, and I would heartily encourage that work that the work needed to ensure that there is strong access and privacy staff in place and trained begin now. Our office opened a total of 84 files in 2018-2019, down just slightly from 86 the previous year. That said, and for comparison purposes, 2019-2020, uh, the year that just ended, saw our busiest year yet with 154 files opened close to double the number in 2018-2019. In Much of this increase has been as a result of breaches under the Health Information Act and the mandatory breach notification provisions in the Act. This suggests that once Bill 29 comes into effect, which requires breach notification for all public bodies, the numbers will likely increase exponentially. Under the ATIP Act, the majority of the files continue to be issues surrounding access to information matters. Of the 55 files opened under ATIP, 30 related in some way to the access to information side of the Act. Uh, of those, eight came to my office by way of review because public bodies have failed to respond to, to an access to information request on time and were in a deemed refusal situation. There were 14 privacy breach files opened uh, in uh, the fiscal year. 18 review reports were issued, all of which are summarized in my annual report. Under the Health Information Act, we opened a total of 29 files. Of those, the majority, 18, were breach notifications received from the Department of Health and Social Services or another health information custodian under the mandatory notification provisions. We issued seven review reports under the Health Information Act during the fiscal year. Most of the reported breaches were relatively minor, but we had two that became very public. The first involved the theft of a laptop containing personal health information of virtually every Northwest Territories resident, 40, 000, more than 40,000 individuals. The second came to light when a member of the public found dated mental health and addictions records in Fort Simpson and took them to CBC North. These two files alone have de demanded a significant allocation of time on a part of my office and have caused a lot of negative public comment on the ability of the health sector to respect patient confidentiality. That said, I am overall confident that the level of awareness amongst health care workers and the front line is up and that senior management has, for the most part, been supportive and willing to work toward improvement. The increasing workload and ability of my very small staff to keep up to date continues to be a concern. The ATIP Act currently gives me six months to complete a review. That goal is quite simply not being met. As of August of last year, I was a full year behind in completing review reports. What that means is it was taking me 18 months to get a review report completed instead of the six required. With the new assistant commissioner investigator who started working with my office in March of 2019, and by hiring some contractors to help with investigations and report writing, we've been able to whittle away at the backlog, but with a doubling of new files coming in the door, for every report we complete, it seems we put two more on the list. The backlog is being reduced, uh, particularly since we've been working from home, uh, but it is not being reduced nearly as much as I would like it to be. I understand that money may have been allocated in the March budget to hire a new investigator, and we are hoping to be able to get that position up and running as soon as possible so that we can erase the backlog before the new legislation kicks in and decreases the time for my office to complete a review from six months to four and a half months. Before closing, 
I wanted to take just a few seconds to recognize Denise Anderson, who's been the ATIP manager for the Government of Northwest Territories Department of Justice, I think for as long as I've been the Information and Privacy Commissioner. She called me a few weeks ago to tell me that she had decided to leave her position. The GNWT is losing an incredible resource and a wealth of knowledge, and she'll be missed. I wanted to publicly thank, thank her for her work and her passion over the years. Sorry. I have been doing this work now for some 23 years, since 1997 which makes me the longest serving information and privacy commissioner in Canada. My current appointment, however, comes to an end on October 31st of this year, and I will not be seeking to renew that appointment. This therefore is likely my last appearance before this committee. It has always been one of the highlights of my year, as I'm always as I am very passionate about what I do, and I love having a captive audience who has to listen to me. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the work that my office does, and I believe is very important work. I thank you for your attention, and would invite any questions or comments the committee might have. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. keenan Bents, and, and as you noted, uh, this is likely your last appearance in before the Standing Committee in your role as the Information of Privacy Commissioner. And on behalf of the members of this committee, the Assembly and the residents of the Northwest Territories, I want to thank you for your passion and your years of service. You have been the only IPC we've ever known, and your years of service, commitment, and changes to the Act will have a lasting impact on the Northwest Territories. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you very much. The next order of business is to, uh, to, to uh, sorry, to ask for people to ask questions. Um, so members, um, you might recall that we had a briefing on the IPC's uh, report and uh, the information is in your package. It starts on page eight and um, there are, uh, questions sprinkled throughout. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll just start while people get caught up. Um, do, you, uh, do you have information on the budget and expenditures for the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner as a standalone office? I don't think that we receive that level of detail in the budget. Um, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I haven't received any confirmation yet. We did submit a budget, and I am given to understand that um, there is uh, room for a new investigator, um, and um, also um, provisions have been made for a um, more definite salary for the new Information and Privacy Commissioner when they come into office, um, but I haven't received confirmation of anything yet. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Uh, the, the budget, of course, has not yet been passed, so yeah. um, so that, that's pending. But I'm wondering if, uh, given the capacity issues that you've talked about within uh, your office, whether it would be possible for you to provide us with the financials, for example, for the year that we are now discussing, so that we, we have some baseline information to look at. Thank you. Uh, thank you. There, there is some information um, in uh, my annual report. Uh, there's a one page with some uh, graphics. Um, m most of our uh, most of our budget is spent on on uh, staff, um, and um, I believe it was about three uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars total. Uh, things are changing for this office financially because as of March thirty first um, of this year, 
uh, I am no longer, um, there, there's no longer a joint contract between the Northwest Territories and Nunavut for the provision of my services. Um, so my services are now 100% Northwest Territories and I'm working on 100% hours for the Northwest Territories. Um, I maintain my contract in Nunavut, but that's under a separate contract and I'm working essentially weekends over there. Um, so um, it, things are, are very much in flux for our office financially right now. Um, we just got uh, the um, assistant commissioner position filled in March of last year. Um, and that's, I think, increased our budget significantly. Um, we are supposed to, I, I asked actually for four new positions um, to deal with uh, after Bill 29 was, uh, was uh, passed uh, because I see the, um, I, I, I see what's coming in, in terms of extra work. Uh, there's a lot of extra work. Um, the time frames are going to be much shorter. Mm -hmm. So I asked for four positions. Um, I've been advised that I'm getting one new position. Um, I'm hoping that uh, in the next fiscal year, there will be room for yet another. That's not really answering your question, but that's about the most detail I have. Uh, the Legislative Assembly has the actual numbers and should be able to provide you with the budget numbers for uh, my office. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Keenan-Banks uh, committee. Uh, I saw Lisa, then Ryland. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is around to the breaches um, related to one of the, with the faxing. So my past career is in health and I know that health has always put up that had an issue with getting rid of faxing because a lot of our patients in the Northwest Territories that travel out of into Alberta then when we need follow-up information from the organizations like the hospitals and stuff they fax that information <coughs> to either a new Vic, Yellowknife, Fort Smith, wherever they're heading back to. Um, and I know that has been an issue in the past, and it's one of the ones that have been in the media, that faxing going to the wrong numbers. And I know that there was recommendations on the health department to kind of get try to get rid of that. But how has it changed any since? Um, because it was Alberta's policy that wouldn't change. So NWT was fine with encrypted emails, but we couldn't get Alberta to, their policies wouldn't change to send from their end. So has that, have you, has the health department fixed that area? Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Semler, Ms. Keenan-Banks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we're working on it. Um, there are still a lot of um, fax errors. Um, frankly, most of them are not faxing outside of the jurisdiction. Most of them are, are errors within our own health system. Um, and that to me is unacceptable because we have a system in place that allows for secure communication between healthcare providers. Um, and um, it, we're, I think there's more awareness of the issue um, and um, we're working on it. But the fact is that people working in the health system are busy healthcare workers. Um, they're not always thinking about privacy at top of mind when they're uh, rushing around trying to get their work done. They don't always follow all the rules. Um, the more um, education they're given, uh, I think education is the key. I think we, we need to keep on reminding our healthcare workers not to use faxes when other more secure methods are available. It's changing, it's going to take time. 
Thank you, uh, Ms. Keenan Benz. Do you have a follow up, Ms. Yes, Simler? just a follow up in regards to the training. I know that there is some internal training that that is being that's done in government departments. Is there a training? Can your department go out and do training if for different government departments and areas that are having um, acts like having inform people's information? Thank you, Ms. Semler, Ms. Keenan Banks. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a capacity issue for us. Um, we're working full out, just trying to keep up on top of the complaints coming in the door, the access requests coming in the door, the requests for comment, the PIA reviews. Um, we don't have uh, time to, to uh, be doing uh, training, particularly of government uh, agencies. Um, there is a good online system in place uh, for uh, general GNWT employees. There are also a, a suite of um, courses for healthcare workers, and I believe that's online, though I couldn't swear to it. Um, and uh, consistently, we're making recommendations in our on our Health Information Act uh, reports to continue to add to those materials and to. Um, improve them. I mean, the idea of my office doing reports of privacy breaches is not to fix the breach because we can't do that. A breach is a breach and it's already done. But what we can do is learn from the breaches. And um, one of our consistent re uh, recommendations, therefore, is to add add to the uh, materials these real life situations and real life fact situations so that people get it a little bit more. It's easier to understand something when you can see it, how it, it works or how it can happen in real life or in your real work uh, environment. Thank you very much. Can I put you back on the list or you just have one more? It's just a short little. Okay, yeah. Short so, follow-up? So short follow-up. So really the government that you're aware of has training online. So there is no excuse. People should be able to access this and follow it. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sumler, uh, Ms. Keena Banks. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, you, you spoke a bit to how some departments are lacking capacity, and, and, and I, I wanna get a sense of what public bodies or departments are doing ATIP well. Um, I also, I, I, I'm really excited about the new act and, and in many ways I don't think a lot of departments really know what they are getting themselves into and there's a lot of work to be done and people really need to get caught up but I, it's an amazing piece of legislation. I thank all the work you did at and the last assembly. Um, but I, I, I guess I want to get a sense from you of, of which departments, is there someone we can look to and say look they have a handle on this, they're, they're you know, they're, they're ready to onboard the new ATIP Act, or is this just across all public bodies that we are just nowhere there? I'm hoping to find someone that I can say, okay, this is an example of how to do it. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Ms. Keenan-Banks? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, until a few weeks ago, I would have said the Department of Justice is ready um, with Denise Anderson at the helm. Um, however, as I say, we've lost a great resource there. Uh, she was a leader uh, for all departments, um, and her departure is going to leave big, bigger holes uh, than already exist. Um, so um, that's really the only department that I can really point to and say they have a good staff in place who understands the act and understands the exceptions and um, can respond uh, in a timely manner. Right now, we're having real problems with people, uh, with the departments responding in a timely manner. We're having real problems with um, uh, I, the Department of Finance um, is the department that went through three ATIP coordinators in a period of about eight months. Um, that's the department that probably receives the most ATIP requests 
throughout the GNWT because they deal with human resources. So um, there's a capacity issue, I think, throughout uh, all departments. I, I would add, um, and, and I'm, I'm not... Um, <laughs> I'm not helping my situation here any by saying that ATIP is not um, is not a glamorous job within a department. You have to push back. Um, good ATIP coordinators push back, um, and um, that's hard to do um, in many situations. So it, it, it's and, and it's not something that uh, other people around you are really anxious to get on board with. So. It's it's not the most glamorous position. It's a difficult position. It requires expertise, and people don't understand that. I think um, so. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done within all de uh, all departments. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your response, Ms. Keenan Banks. Do you have a follow up question, Mr. Johnson? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, thank you. I appreciate that answer, and I, I, I recognize that's. It, it's also a bit of a cultural thing, and people not really valuing data and getting their systems in line so that the records management is easier. And uh, another issue I find, and I'm concerned how this is going to work, is that ATIP is so much more work. It's more work for your office, but. Uh, to me, ATIP doesn't have to be the process, and, and especially uh, HR. Perhaps you know the exceptions are really in play in health, but for media, which take up a lot of ATIP coordinators' time, they are often getting told no when they ask for something. Go to ATIP, and and I want to get a sense from your office how much that's occurring, and whether that's a bit of a solution to lower everyone's workload in that if a director gets an email, can look at the information and just send it without going through an ATIP process. Because I feel quite often, um, especially in regards to media requests, ATIP's being used as a shield as opposed to a tool to get information that you know could already be public out there. So we could speak to that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, Ms. Keenan Banks. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there's um, there are provisions in in Bill 29, which may help that. I mean, throughout Canada, proactive disclosure, which is what you're talking about, um, it is something that um, information privacy commissioners are dealing with and encouraging and pushing. Um, and the new legislation um, includes some provisions that um, will require public bodies to, uh, there, there's a lot of work to be done before proactive disclosure can just be, um, because the records still have to be vetted to make sure that there's no personal information or, or business information that shouldn't be disclosed and that sort of thing. So once everything is indexed and and organized um, proactive disclosure could reduce my workload by 50 percent maybe more thank you very much uh, for that answer that's obviously the way forward yeah. uh, do other members have questions okay I'll just keep going in order uh, Caitlin and then uh, Frida and uh, our colleague Kevin O'Reilly is online as well and he has some questions. So we'll start with Kate. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, my first question is actually just a follow up in regards to MLA Semler's uh, question about using fax machines within health centers. Um, with the new act, it allows you um, order making capabilities. Is, is removing the option of using faxes in health centers an order that you would foresee yourself making in future to prevent those kinds of security breaches? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Cleveland, Ms. Keenan Banks. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Unfortunately, the order powers will only be under ATIP. Uh, they will not uh, translate in the, under the Health Information Act. Under the Health Information Act, my uh, or my powers will remain recommendation only. So yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that response. Follow up question. Yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, also, in regards to. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you. Oh, sorry. 
Also in regards to um, health uh, information, we know that the North is a very um, small place and it just gets smaller and smaller every day with the more connections that we make, um, which is fabulous for most things, but when it comes to health records, it can be a concern. And so um, my understanding is that the Department of Health our, or NTHSSA was looking for ways to limit certain people's access to people's personal health record information within their electronic uh, chart system. Can you speak a little bit to where they're at with that? Thank you, uh, Ms. Cleveland, Ms. Keenan-Banks. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. This is this is one of my um, biggest concerns right now. Section, I think it's 22, the Health Information Act, um, gives uh, an individual the right the right to control who has access to their personal health information. I should be able to provide a directive to my local clinic that says I don't want Joe Blow or Sam Schmier or my neighbor uh, to have any access to my health record. Unfortunately, the current system, um, and there's been no change as far as I know, uh, it's been like this since the act came into effect. Um, the system is not, um, doesn't have the functionality which would allow um, for uh, that to happen. So um, there are a lot of cases in which there, there's a number of cases, particularly with healthcare employees who don't want um, their um, who don't want their colleagues to see their personal health information, for instance. Um, and uh, a, a case up in Inuvik not too long ago, um, I was just rereading the report the other day where um, the, the, the patient and employee asked many times to have uh, his um, records um, protected from fellow employees and um, that just was never done because the electronic system doesn't have the functionality to do it. Um, the, it. It's contrary to the law right now and um, something needs to be done and it's one of the first things I highlighted when the Act came into effect, the Health Information Act came into effect um, uh, and I've been given the same answer virtually ever since and that, and that is, is that the current system we have doesn't have that functionality and um, they tell me they're working on it but they don't give me details. Thank you very much Ms. Keenan Banks. I'll go next. Sorry to... I'm not hearing you. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, can you uh, hear me now? You're back. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your response. I'll go now to uh, MLA Freedom Arts so, Madam Chair, I just have uh, two uh, two points that I want to ask. One of them is um, uh, on page three, the uh, the right of the public to have access to any record in the custody in in the custody or control of a public body, body subject to limited and specific exceptions. So, I'm just wondering what the limited and specific exceptions are. That's my first question. And the second question is, oh, we're talking about a lot of the, uh, about the healthcare uh, system. Uh, do you feel that uh, if the training on ethical values was given to, uh, especially those that are handling uh, healthcare um, records that uh, you would have less, uh, less breaches? Uh, those are my two questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Ms. Marcellos. Uh, Ms. King next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, with respect to the first question, uh, the exceptions to disclosure are set out in sections uh, 13 to 25 of the Access to Information Protection and Privacy Act. Um, there are three mandatory exceptions. That is, if the information meets the criteria, then the public body cannot disclose. And that is 
um, where the information would result in an unreasonable invasion of an individual's privacy, uh, uh, for cabinet confidences, and for um, the third one is uh, business propriety, proprietary business information. In those instances, the public body cannot disclose if the information falls into the category. Um, other, uh, all of the other um, exceptions, um, and I will probably miss some of them because I don't have the act in front of me, but they're all discretionary. That means that if they meet the criteria, the public body still has to look at it and make a determination as to whether or not it should be disclosed. And I've always taken the position that disclosure is the default. Um, and those include things like uh, consultations between government employees, um, uh, where there's a law enforcement issue, solicitor client privilege. Um, there are a few others. I, 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 like I say, there, there are 13 to 23, uh, 25 of the Act, but um, they're all set out in the Act. They all need interpretation. I've interpreted most of them. Some of them have never been used. I've never seen um, a matter come across my desk um, dealing with some of the exceptions. The environmental exceptions are rarely used. Um, but there are those uh, set out in the Act, and uh, they are applied to, they are supposed to be applied to every sentence of every line of uh, information that is disclosed. So in order to review a document, an ATIP coordinator has to go through every line of every page that's disclosed and take out, redact those provisions or those parts of it um, that are subject to either um, a mandatory exception or a discretionary, discretionary exception. Did I answer that question completely? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Keenan-Banks. Do you have a follow-up? Uh, or did, were you still continuing, Ms. Keenan-Banks? I, I was, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to um, uh, speak to the second qu question, which was a question about uh, ethical values training. Um, <sighs> Most medically trained professionals, that is doctors, nurses, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, have a really good grounding in uh, ethical values training. Those who don't, who work in medical health offices, receptionists, uh, janitors, um, the others, they don't necessarily have that training. Um, so there needs to be perhaps more emphasis put on the um, on the uh, non-medical staff in in offices um, in terms of training. That said, um, even medical professionals don't always uh, think through the privacy impacts of the things they're doing. Um, and um, I can guarantee you that there are not a lot of uh, medical professionals, whether they're at whatever level, um, who have read the Health Information Act and fully understand it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Keenan Banks. Do you have a follow up question, Emily Martzels? Okay. Thank you. I'll now turn to uh, Emily Kevin O'Reilly. Uh, could you uh, ask your questions, please? Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, first off, I just want to thank uh, the uh, commissioner personally. Uh, 23 years of public service <laughs> in the same job is uh, quite an accomplishment. I know I was involved in the original uh, drafting of the legislation with Sam Gargan and John Vertes back in the early 1990s, but you've done a great job and just want to thank you personally for uh, your commitment uh, to public service. Um, I noted in the uh, report that you uh, expressed a little bit of concern about implementation of the uh, 
the amendments. Uh, we did make some major changes, and, and a lot of that thanks to your input as well. Um, I did ask the minister in the House on March the 2nd. Uh, she said that the bill, uh, the amendments would come into force in the fall. Uh, I'm a bit worried about the capacity, and you've mentioned the uh, uh, change coming in terms of the ATIP manager. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any other suggestions, advice about uh, resourcing and what kinds of things need to be followed up. Uh, that's one question, uh, Madam Chair, and then I have one other one as well. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Ms. Keenan Banks. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the number one thing that needs to be done is um, getting well trained and knowledgeable uh, ATIP coordinators in place um, in the various departments. Um, I know that there has been some talk of. Um, uh, centralizing ATIP, which might be a good idea. Um, there have been kind of mixed results in other parts of the country where that's been done. Um, that could help to uh, centralize, to create a pool of expertise. Um, if everyone is working, if there's a group of people who are all doing access and privacy and have an expertise and can talk to one another and, and learn from each other and um, that'll create a couple of things. That'll create consistency um, in responses. That could be a bad thing um, because they could be consistently bad responses, but, uh, you know, it, it will create consistency. And, and, and it will create that pool of expertise, which is going to be all important in um, the coming into effect of this legislation. We need people who know and understand the law around privacy and access. And I guarantee you that this is not expertise that is easy to come by. Um, it's, um, it, it, it's not um, as yet uh, a career. Uh, you know, People don't come out of high school saying, I'm going to be an access coordinator or I'm going to be a privacy commissioner. Um, on the privacy side of things, th there's more expertise than there was five years ago maybe. Uh, on the access to information side of things, probably not. Um, so what we really need for this act, for this legislation to be successful, is a core group of experts within the government. Uh, thank you, Ms. Keenan-Banks. So just to be clear about this recommendation, uh, would, you, would you recommend that the function be centralized? As, as a way to create this pool of expertise and more consistent responses? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, with reservations. Um, and my reservations are, it depends on who, uh, it depends on the mindset of, of the individual leading that group. Um, in some jurisdictions, uh, the person, um, at the helm, so to speak, is not has not been a, a champion of access or a champion of privacy. And if the person at the helm is not a champion, um, then the rest of the expertise will tend towards um, um, denying access and that sort of thing. Uh, with the right people at the helm, I think it is a very good solution. Um, and creating a pool of expertise may be the only solution for a small jurisdiction um, because it's hard. It's In fact, I'll, I'd venture to say it's impossible to have an expert in access and privacy in every, juris or in every department. Um, and having that pool of experts work together, and like I say, can feed off one another. And I, I can tell you, having, uh, having now had an assistant commissioner in my office for the last year, um, we have some hearty debates, um, which I never was able to have before, and I find it improves, um, it, it improves the work I do tremendously. So um, that kind of being able to, um, you know, play off one another and, and, and work together and understand and discuss things together uh, would probably be a really good thing. 
Thank you very much for that response. Are there any other questions from committee? Um, I don't see Mr. O'Reilly on the screen here. Is he there? Oh, okay. Uh, go ahead, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, I just a uh, quick question to the, the commissioner. Um, in this time of uh, COVID and pandemic, um, I think that it's probably difficult for government to be responding to privacy uh, uh, requests, uh, access to information requests. How are other jurisdictions dealing with this? Are they allowing for extensions or how is this uh, uh, impacting the, the ability to respond and application of the legislation and so on in other jurisdictions and any suggestions, recommendations for us here in the Northwest Territories? Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, Ms. Keenan-Banks. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm going to start with the obvious statement that the law is the law. <laughs> And um, an access to information request uh, requires a response within 30 days. Um, and, and that's my position and will be my position. And if I, if, and I haven't yet received um, an access or, or, or a request from a member of the public because of a deemed refusal, i.e. they haven't received a response within 30 days, I'll have to deal with that. How are other jurisdictions dealing with it? Um, I think most uh, other Information and Privacy Commissioner's offices are taking the same position I am. That is, the law is the law, and you should be responding within 30 days. Um, and if you don't, um, the review provisions kick in. Um, I am hoping that um, we will be able to resolve most of those through um, some discourse as opposed to having to do a review report on all of them. Um, and I think, frankly, most people are being quite respectful of the COVID situation. And I understand um, quite, quite clearly that um, in order to get access to the records that are uh, responsive to access requests, people have to be in their offices and they can't be in their offices right now. Um, so we gotta deal with reality um, on the one hand and we have to deal with the law on the other hand and um, uh, we need to try and juggle both. But I am glad um, that you brought up the COVID issue because um, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of, uh, 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 there's a lot of risk to privacy right now. Um, it, it's extreme. Um, I heard yesterday, for example, and I'm not suggesting that this is happening in Canada, but um, in, in China where they uh, insisted on people using um, tracking apps on their phones are now um, saying that these apps will be permanent. That's the kind of thing that a privacy um, some, somebody who's concerned about privacy cringes at. Um, it's so easy once something is in place to keep it in place and it's so hard to remove it once it's in place. And we have to be so careful that we don't do things now um, to deal with this emergent situation um, that will forever change our privacy rights. Um, and um, the deep, I, I'm a little concerned that I haven't had, uh, I, I know that the Department of Health is um, dealing with uh, circumstances beyond their control and they're trying to deal with it respectful, respectfully in terms of privacy. But I haven't had any privacy impact assessments provided to me since this began two months ago. And I know that there are um, things being done um, in the um, in the COVID space um, that will affect our privacy. So um, this is this is not something that's going to go away today or tomorrow. And uh, I know I'm off topic, and this is not about uh, this appearance is not about today, but it's about my 2018-19 report. Um, but I thought it was important to get that in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Keenan-Banks. I appreciate you 
uh, flagging that concern. It, you know, it, it is a current concern, and uh, and those are things that we can respond to as regular members. Um, we are almost at the end of the hearing time. Um, are there any more questions uh, at all for Ms. Keenan Bents? So seeing none, uh, I'd like to thank you again for your appearance here today and for all your years of service. And um, we will bring the, uh, this portion of the, of the Standing Committee on Government Operations to a conclusion. Is there a motion to go in camera? Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Okay, thank you, Ms. Keenan-Banks. Thank you.